Hello, my name is Stefan, and this is Japan at War. In late 1588, Hideyoshi ordered Tsushima's newest daimyo to dispatch a second mission to Korea to demand submission. This time, Yoshitoshi personally took the lead, and with him was a group of 25 men, including Yamagawa Shigenobu, a leading retainer of the So clan, and Genso Kaitetsu, a 52 year old Buddhist monk whose scholarly presence it was hoped would help the mission find common ground. Now, the mission arrived in Seoul in around February 1589. Once there, they made sure not to repeat Yutani's mistakes and conducted themselves with much more decorum. So, during this time, delivered Yoshitoshi's newest letter to the Koreans, which read When my mother conceived me, it was by a beam of sunlight that entered into her bosom in a dream. After my birth, a fortune teller said that. All the land the sun shone on would be mine. And when I became a man, and that my fame would spread beyond the four seas, I have never fought without conquering, and when I strike, I always win. Man cannot outlive his hundred years, so why should I sit chafing on this island? I will make a leap and land in China, and there lay my laws upon her. I shall go by the way of Korea, and if your soldiers would join me in this invasion, you have shown your neighborly, neighborly spirit. I am determined that my name shall pervade the three kingdoms. It was, well, shocking to the Koreans and to King Sanjo, who confirmed this warlord was uncivilized and should be ignored. Many of the king's officials, however, were no longer ashore. After a long discussion, they really realized Hideyoshi posed a real threat, and friendly relations should be established so that they could gain intelligence on him and the situation in Japan. The Koreans approached So Yoshitoshi with a proposal. They would send a goodwill mission to Japan in exchange, Japan would bring to justice a group of renegade Koreans. Who had aided Japanese pirates in raiding the southern coast. They were hiding somewhere in western Japan, and the Chosan wanted them returned. Yoshitoshi knew that they would never agree to send a tribute mission and agreed to settle for a goodwill mission. Yanagawa Shigenobu was sent back to Japan and soon reappeared with 10 of the wanted men in ropes. They were questioned before King Sanjo in Seoul's. Hall of Humane Government, and then were decapitated. <laughs> the Koreans were pretty happy. So Yoshitoshi was at last granted an audience with King Sanjo, and they exchanged gifts. Yoshitoshi received a horse and presented the king with a peacock and a few arquebus. Now, funny enough, they actually thought very little of the guns and actually compared them to dog legs. Now, after waiting on the weather for a prolonged period, the Koreans dispatched their goodwill mission to Japan in April 1590. It was led by Ambassador Huang Yungil. Vice Ambassador Kim Song il and Recording Secretary Ho Song, an unavoidable choice mirroring the two parties that split the government in half. Now, Ambassador Huang was quiet, peaceful, And a part of the rising Western faction. And while the Moody Kim and Secretary Ho were both from the Eastern Party, Kim especially hated Huang, calling him too timid to actually deal with the Japanese. Now, you can probably tell that this is going to cause issues. They were accompanied from Seoul across the sea to Kyushu. By So Yoshitoshi, Yamagawa Shigenobu, and the monk Genso. And it wasn't a very happy trip. When they stopped in, in Tsushima, So Yoshitoshi invited them to a banquet and then immediately offended them by coming in by sedan chair instead of walking in. Huang was ready to overlook this, but Kim was not, saying, Tsushima is our vassal. We came here. 
on the imperial command of our majesty. How dare you insult us like this? I refuse to attend this banquet. Yoshitoshi apologized and blamed the sedan chair bearers and had them executed and their heads presented to the Koreans. After that, they, tr they treated the ambassadors with a lot more care going forward. Yet Kim would continue to find the Japanese offensive in the coming months. They arrived in Kyoto in August of 1590 after four months of travel and stayed at the Daito Kuji, a rather complex Buddhist temple complex at the northern edge of the city. There they waited. Summer heat gave way to the cool winds of fall, and still they waited. Hideyoshi was not there. He was in the northeast at Odawara, looking after the siege, grinding Hojo Ujimasa down, the daimyo of Honshu's central Kanto region. Toyotomi Hideyoshi eventually returned to Kyoto in October with Hojo dead, but still he made the Koreans wait. Hideyoshi wanted the Japanese emperor Goyozai in attendance, but his petition was rejected, and it wasn't until December that the Korean mission was invited to appear before Hideyoshi at his gilded residence, the Jurokadai. When foreign ambassadors visited Seoul, it was customary for the Chosan king to host lavish banquets where nothing was spared. Hideyoshi's reception was different. Ambassadors Huang and Kim, as well as their entourage, arrived in the Jurokadai by sedan chair and were allowed to proceed into the palace without lighting. A suitable sign of respect and was actually quite pleasing to the Koreans. They were led into the reception hall and got their first glance at Hideyoshi. He sat at the back of the hall in black robe and gauze hat. After four months of waiting, the Koreans were then able to deliver their letter, addressed to the King of Korea to the King of Japan, and expressed a desire to cultivate friendly relations. Now with that task out of the way, a feast would have been expected as the Koreans and Chinese protocol normally demanded. But there was no tables of food or in fact any sign that one was being prepared. The Koreans and Japanese in attendance were simply in rows before Hideyoshi with a plate of rice cakes passing around. Then a bowl of sake was passed around and everybody took a sip. That was it. As the Koreans sat in confused silence, Hideyoshi rose and left the hall, and after a time reappeared now wearing everyday clothes and holding his infant son, Surumatsu. He walked through the hall, cooing to the child, and then had musicians play music. The child then peed on him, which made Hideyoshi laugh. He then gave the child to an attendant and with a wet stain on his clothes, left the hall. All the Japanese in attendance bowed their heads and this time he did not come back out. The audience was over. Now, in defense of Hideyoshi, he probably wasn't trying to be rude. In fact, he understood display better than anyone and could have easily had a feast prepared but his decision not to was most likely a demonstration of his power. See, he chose when or when not to host a feast. He was Hideyoshi, and it was his place to choose. The Korean mission, still in the company of Soyoshi Toshi and the monk Genso, left Kyoto to the port of Sakai to await Hideyoshi's reply to the letter that they had delivered from King Sanjo. Their mission was a failure. Instead of gathering intelligence, they had spent most of the time in the records recording everything wrong with Japan and how it differed from the Chinese model of social order. Ambassador Kim's assessment of Hideyoshi was probably the biggest failure. There was no appreciation of the danger he posed, and there was instead a focus on their view of a lack of decorum. 
Kim would also say that they were unworthy of a goodwill mission, and that having a mission from the course in the Chosun Corps appear before Hideyoshi was humiliating. Their second biggest failure of the mission was their was its inability to convey where Korea actually where it stood in all this. They would welcome Japan as a fellow tributary state, but that it would in fact never submit. And honestly, though, this probably would have been hard to do. Most of their talks would have been done in Chinese characters, and they also weren't allowed any direct contact with Hideyoshi. And anything his underlings conveyed probably never made it to his ears. It also probably wasn't the healthiest thing to tell him things he didn't want to hear. And when Yoshitoshi appeared with the Koreans, I mean, he just drew his own conclusions, and no one dared tell him differently. So Hideyoshi never understood it was simply a goodwill mission and not a sign of submission. To him, it was tribute and a sign that the conquests of Asia were going exactly as he planned. He was so happy with the success, in fact, that he gave So Yoshitoshi a court promotion and the honor of using the family name Hashiba, which was actually the name Hideyoshi used for a bit in the early 1580s. With so many misunderstandings, it's not surprising that the reply from Hideyoshi to King Sanjo that was handed to the ambassadors was not well received. After reiterating his greatness, Hideyoshi thanked King San Sanjo for sending a tribute mission and for su surrendering to the Japanese courts. And he now ordered him to prepare to join Hideyoshi in his conquest of China. The Koreans protested until the Japanese finally re relented by removing the reference to Korea's surrender. Everything else, though, remained. Now, once back in Seoul, Ambassador Huang and Kim appeared before the king and his ministers in the March of 1591 to give their assessments of Hideyoshi. Huang and the Western Party said that he had the piercing eyes of a man of resourcefulness and seemed fully prepared to go to war, and he definitely posed a threat. Kim Song-il of the Eastern Party strongly disagreed. Hideyoshi had the eyes of a rat and the brown skin of a peasant, and he was not to be feared. And there was absolutely no need to take defensive measures. Now, with the balance of power swinging in the Eastern Party's favor, that assessment given by Kim actually had the bigger impact. During the following months, there would be more evidence that Huang was right but by then it had been politicized, and little would be done in terms of defensive measures. Now, as you, the audience, follow this war with us, think back on this moment of what could have been. The monk Genso and Yanagawa Shigenobu had, in the meantime, followed the Korean embassy back to Seoul and were doing all they could to get the government to accept Hideyoshi's demands. Genzo even lied to Kim Song-il and others saying Hideyoshi wanted a fight with China because that they had simply refused to accept Japan as a vassal and that he had every right to march his armies to Beijing and demand recognition. And all the Koreans had to do was just simply step aside. When the Koreans protested, Genzo actually pointed out that Korea had actively participated in China's attempt to invade Japan in the 13th century, so it was reasonable for them to let Hideyoshi have his revenge. They refused still, and the one thing both political factions could agree on was that Hideyoshi's wild talk should not go unchallenged. A letter stating their position was handed to Genzo and Ya. Yanagawa for delivery to Kyoto. Hideyoshi's plan to evade China was beyond comprehension, and that his demand for Korea to join him showed how little he actually understood the world. 
the letter read, We shall certainly not desert our Lord and Father nation and join a neighboring nation in her unjust and unwise military undertaking. Moreover, to evade another nation is an act of which men of culture and intellectual attainment should feel ashamed. We shall not certainly take arms against the supreme nation. And as all the members of our nation are just and righteous persons, as well as cultured and intellectual in their attainments, they know how to revere their Lord and Father nation. We urgently hope that you will reflect on these things and will come to understand your own situation as well as ours. We would conclude this letter by saying that your proposed undertaking is the most reckless, imprudent, and daring of any which we have ever heard. Y yeah, this was not what he wanted to hear. To him, they had just sent a tribute mission and now we're talking down to him. He immediately sent So Yoshitoshi back to Korea with one final warning, submit or war. Now, Yoshitoshi understood the danger, and he in fact actually did not go all the way to Seoul, but instead he delivered his message the way, well, the way he did was by handing it to the authorities in Busan on the southern coast. He then remained on his ship, and when it was clear that there would be no reply, he, re he returned to Tsushima to prepare for war. Over the next several months, the few remaining occupants of Busan's Japan house packed up their things and left quietly. By spring 1582, the compound was deserted.